Welcome to When Movies Were Good, a laid-back discussion about all your favourite films from the silent era up until 1959. You can hear our channel's content on YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and follow all new updates and events on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Please give us a thumbs up or a good review, whatever your favourite podcast channel allows for. It helps to get us in front of more people. And now, on with the show. Hello everybody, welcome back to a new episode of When Movies Were Good. We're talking to you live, well we're recording live here in Melbourne, Australia with yours truly Rachel and my special guest star, the Jonathan Harris of this podcast, Matt. How are you Matt? Fantastic, thank you. Um, it's been a busy sort of couple of months for me and Matt. We've been gallivanting around the place. Matt has moved. I went up to Sydney for a bit, you know, working this, that. Matt started a new traineeship. There's lots of different things happening. So um, we're grateful to be recording today. And and now we're sort of definitely getting into the winter period here in Melbourne. It's um, bleak, it's overcast and a perfect day to talk movies. Yes, even if I had the time to do fishing, it's not good weather for it anyway. So yes, I get to uh, spend more time with my beautiful audience. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, thank you for joining us today while we discuss... Um, we've decided to do um, an episode where we discuss a an original version and then a remake, but they, they fit into the the ballpark of the era of films that we discuss. So and we're, that's to say nothing of the two much more modern remakes. Which are probably, well, for modern audiences, more well-known uh, just due to the, the female singers that are in them. But we're, we're discussing A Star Is Born 1937. So that version was the Technicolor version produced by David O'Selznick, directed by William Wellman, from a script by Wellman, Robert Carson, Dorothy Parker and Alan Campbell, starring the lovely Janet Gaynor um, in her only Technicolor film. She actually retired not a few years after this film was made, sadly enough, and with um, Frederick March in it playing um, the, the male lead. Uh, so that's the first one we will be discussing. And then um, not that long after, 1954, we have Judy Garland's very musical version. I guess this is more of sort of like an epic sort of musical story, um, whereas the first version was more of a, a drama with other elements brought into it. So we had um, Judy performing with James Mason. So a few years ago, or well, probably about four years ago now, Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper did their version of A Star Is Born and then in 1976 we had Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson did their version of A Star Is Born. So essentially it is the same story of a sort of washed up performer who still is quite famous but struggling with addiction. So in this case the male character which is the same in each of these versions sort of making a discovery of a young ingenue perhaps someone maybe from the wrong side of the tracks who just needed a a break and a start in life. And that's the Janet Gaynor character and the Judy Garland character. Uh, And as their star is rising, the, the male, the male lead Norman in this case, um, and in both of the films we're discussing, both of the char- the characters' names are the same, um, sort of ends up on a downward spiral. So as interesting and uplifting as elements of these two films are, actually the four films, I would say, there's a lot that's quite depressing in a way, isn't it, Matt? <laughs> well, yeah, I think part of why so many uh, versions, versions of the story has been made, because I think apart from Little Women, I which is another one of those stories that every generation wants to make its mark on and interpret Mm. in its own way. Uh, Very few stories uh, uh, tempt filmmakers to redo like every 20 or 30 years. And it is that sort of perfect combination of um, uh, empathizing with an underdog and hoping um, it goes um, well for them. But on the other hand, you also have the, uh, the, the hero at the uh, sort of the, or the anti-hero at the beginning who then themselves becomes the underdog and you feel sympathy for them too. So it's this story that just uh, really works well in a good in a good tie in a sort of a Pride and Prejudice element of the um, 
of a twisting of the character sympathy. Uh, I've sort of um, been coming up with a little metaphor in my head for since we started watching these films, and uh, I'd like to say, say that the Star of Bo- Star Wars Born story is uh, like an artist painting a ball of fruit. Uh, it never it never gets uh, all the way the amount of ways they can repaint that ball of fruit with a different artist. Yeah, well, that's true. I think they sort of the more modern take on it is to elevate. Um, in the case of the 76 version with Barbara Streisand and the 2018 version with Lady Gaga. Now, I've only seen previews and some of the musical numbers from those films. Um, I'm curious to watch the Streisand version. I've seen parts of that on TV. I know I have. There was just something about the Lady Gaga, Bradley Cooper version. It was the title song or something that put me off. It just, the whole thing just looked extremely depressing. Um, and I understand from watching now, watching the 30s version and the 50s version, as much as I did like them, they are extremely depressing films, especially as we get further into the film and the downhill spiral of the male character. I mean, um, I was surprisingly impressed by how great an actress Lady Gaga turned out to be because I knew beforehand she was a singer known for her um, uh, flamboyant uh, dresses and everything mm. and hairstyles. But I didn't uh, know she, or has she only got into acting recently? I don't know. But uh, I w- was impressed by her and in House of Gucci. But I, I like I was saying before, the beginning like uh, Judy Garland, who who had um, a quite tragic life of her own. The tone of the film, her version of A Star Is Born, is a lot more positive. But it does mean that when things turn really dark, especially for her character, who's supporting. Uh, the addicted Norman Maine uh, and supporting him with his alcoholism, when it gets to the dark and sad bits, they really count. Yeah, they do. Um, And both of them, I thought I really enjoyed both the male leads in the films that we're discussing. Um, So I really liked Frederick March in uh, his portrayal of Norman. And I did like James Mason in his portrayal of Norman, but I sort of felt like... I still just think that the role of Norman works better as an American actor who's, you know, I sort of wanted to know a little bit more about James Mason's version of Norman's, like how did this English guy end up in the US? How did he, did he have a bad family life in the UK? Or I would have liked to have had that addressed a little bit more and obviously that wasn't the focus of, you know, it was just... He was fleshed out a lot more than the first version of A Star Is Born where Norman Maine was more of a Clark Gable um, uh, carbon copy sort of. Yeah, that's true. I I guess so. And um, obviously with the 50s version, the Judy Garland version, being a real sort of epic musical feat as well, you know, the the film, you know, I'm not really hugely into long films unless they have intermissions, which this one did. Um, You know, the film went for nearly three hours. And even the first... Hard to enjoy a film if you're thinking about the bathroom. Yeah. (laughs) So I'm a big fan. I don't mind long films if they have intermissions, which this one did. So that was fine. And, um, and even the, the 37 version with the lovely Janet Gaynor in it. And I hadn't seen, obviously always had known of Janet Gaynor, but hadn't seen much of her stuff. It was lovely to finally actually see her. And this was, um, she was, even though she was coming towards the end of her career, I was reading that this kind of kickstarted her career again. But by that point she was in her early thirties and she had made that decision that she wanted to get married and have a family, which she did shortly thereafter. And as Matt and I were discussing before we started recording, that's pretty much what the young starlets did. They had their 10 years working and then after that, then they really wanted to get away, and which is probably the best thing to do for the child, really. Um, and then, you know, if they're able to step back into it as, a, as an older person, which Janet Gaynor did, unfortunately she was plagued by some health problems later in life with an accident that she sustained with one of her best friends, and I didn't want to have to bring it up, but I, I, I'm going to bring it up because one of her best friends was Mary Martin, who was Larry Hagman's mother, as we all know, in case you missed it. Yeah, well, um, uh, to those that have tuned in more recently, uh, Rachel does really love any story that could be linked to Larry Hagman. And I'm thinking, um, anybody just listening now, um, they're going to be like, w- why is Rachel suddenly so excited that she was in an accident? Um, I know, I wasn't, yeah, they were actually, um, Mary Martin was quite badly injured herself, and I do remember 
Larry discussing that, that they sort of reconnected after she was in this accident because they'd sort of had a strained relationship over the years. Uh, and um, I forgot that it was actually Janet Gaynor, who even though Mary Martin herself was, was primarily known more as a Broadway and stage and singing actress, she did do some Hollywood films. So she was around these people and she was very good friends with a lot of them. So, uh, so I completely forgot that Janet Gaynor was one of her good friends and that they were in this accident together. But that was sort of interesting to reread all of that. Um, so out of these two versions, which one did you prefer and why if you if you did? So remembering the 50s version with Judy Garland, obviously Judy Garland was a huge singing star as well. Um, she, you know, there were several big musical set pieces, singing, dancing, beautiful colour, beautiful staging. But even in the um, first film, it was quite beautifully well done. There was a lot of interaction with, you know, the hustle and bustle of the studios, etc. cetera. Um, what did you think? Would you have a preference or you like both of them for different reasons? Well, I am a bit of a sucker for the great musicals. And so I am obviously drawn into A Star Is Born in that way. And it has to be said that there is... Uh, it's almost like looking at um, the modern and the old version of a Thomas, the Thomas Crown Affair, where there's actually even quite a lot of the same dialogue. Yes. So in, in many ways, uh, uh, when you're looking at the raw script, a lot of it is quite similar, and it would be easy for some to, to dismiss the second version with Judy Garland as a uh, well, sort of a um, an enhancement of the original s- story by adding musical numbers, but. Uh, no, Judy Garland especially, and mind you, I, I do love James Mason. Uh, he was great in uh, in uh, North by Northwest. Yes, that's right, yep. Uh, but he plays a more sympathetic character now. Uh, but yeah, Judy Garland, who in many ways was Norman Maine herself in real life, she had to deal with substance abuse, and we know her full story. It was uh, pretty much every, every jerk um, she worked under was shoving... Um, Diet, diet, and uh, sleeping and waking pills into her, which uh, led to alcohol yeah. abuse and uh, ruined and ruined her body. Uh, she yes, um, yeah, she didn't. She'd have, she'd have um, had so many uh, uh, lawsuits if she were around today. And the tragic and tragedy for Judy Garland um, is like uh, she'd have if she'd had a more normal childhood, she'd have very dist. Like, she probably only died in, in recent years if she left... Well, uh, she uh, lived at a similar time to Mickey Rooney, and he only yeah. died really recently. So yeah. the fact that she died in the 60s uh, says something about um, how her life spiralled down. Yeah, she's only... I'm kind of getting towards the age she was when she died, and uh, she just looks so much older than me. I was just like, she she was in her 60s. When, no, no, she was only in her late 40s. And it's just like, oh, my gosh, you know. she Even in A Star Is Born, she even looked older than what she was then. So, obviously... The, and she was only, like, 30. Yeah, and obviously the effects of... It is actually a tragedy because all the way through her version of A Star Is Born, I just kept thinking, well, what happened to her husband's character, Norman, the James Mason character in the film, is actually what happened to her. And, um, I mean, her death was, you know, she was in London sort of performing at this sort of grotty nightclub, I suppose you could say. She was getting paid for it and everything, but really it was such a come down from the highs of being, you know, at MGM and The Wizard of Oz and all these great, you know, um, uh, Meet Me in St. Louis and all these fantastic films that she'd been a part of. And to be this sort of like woman that could barely walk properly and even seeing what's happened to her daughter now, although her daughter is in her seventies, but um, yeah, it was just, it was just very sad and it was ruled an accidental overdose. So, you know, she just took one too many things on that particular day. And obviously her body was weak from, um, from all the substance abuse, but it is a tragedy. And And some of those accidental mixings of drugs or residuals of um, drugs in your system can happen even now. I mean, look at, um, uh, some people like uh, Heath Ledger, Heath Ledger and yeah. uh, Major, I think his was uh, from illicit substance, but uh, there have been a recent death even now. Uh, yeah, it's just one. I mean, Michael or, Jackson, or yeah, well, just style, one thing too many. Like, like even um, prescription drugs, um, when you're taking too many, can uh, react negatively. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I think you know, if you're taking one thing to counteract the other thing to t- counteract the other thing, eventually your body just says no. Yeah. So two grains of rice balance a scale, but no better than if the scale were empty to begin with. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
my yes. Confu- my Confucius moment. Yeah, definitely. But you know, you're very right about that. So the sad thing with the with the 54 version is knowing eventually what does happen to Judy Garland. But she had um, she had a lot to do in this film because not only did she have all these big song and dance numbers, which you know she has that very striking voice, and you know straight away that's Judy Garland. Um, I don't think dancing was perhaps her most natural ability, but she definitely gave it a go. So she actually had a lot to do in this film. And then there were the highs of doing these big, big theatrical dance singing numbers, and then having to sort of play this really emotional stuff with James Mason and with the people that knew James Mason's character, Norman, as he was going down and down and down. And then also just the sadness at the end where in her version, you know, spoiler alert, um, Norman just decides to walk into the ocean and, and um, end his life that way. And um, But I think as much as I liked that version, I actually preferred the first version. I preferred the one with Janet Gaynor in it. I like the fact that um, so, sometimes, because obviously the last three versions of A Star Is Born featured a famous singer in the role of the, the person that's going to become the star. Whereas in Janet Gaynor's version, she wanted to be an actress and she did become a great actress. And, I and it sort of stripped it, the story down to its bare bones. Yes, that's what I was going for. I think that's why I slightly preferred the first version because I understand why they wanted to introduce the musical aspect into the last three versions. You know, we get tie-ins with hit songs and soundtracks and all that sort of stuff. Um, And that's especially relevant with the Streisand and Gaga versions. But the original story, the first go that they had at it, with her just wanting to be an actress and him being an actor, Norman, Frederick March's Norman being an actor, they were just competing in that realm. So I suppose, you know, if he was a singer as well, then which is what they made, you know, Bradley Cooper's character and Chris Christopherson's character to be in their versions, they were they were singers too. They sort of changed it over. And in the first version, Norman Maine's far less sympathetic. He just simply likes to party and have a good time. There isn't that much sympathy given to him as a uh, as a substance um, addict uh, compared mm-hmm. to even what um, Judy Garland's version gives. Yeah. So it does uh, uh, reflect more... Uh, for one thing... Uh, not so sympathetic attitude of the times to to drinking mm-hmm. uh, and addiction, uh, but also that uh, it's meant to portray Norman uh, more as the victim of his own selfishness. I mean, the yeah. fact that he uh, uh, gets into the Oscars and unlike uh, James Mason, who's you're like, my God, you feel like my my God, he would only be doing something like this, embarrassing his wife at the what should be the finest moment of her. Life accepting her first Oscar yeah. in the in front of the in front of the world, and he's only ruining the moment because he's just he, he just doesn't know what he's doing. doing. He's so far back. Whereas uh, Norman Maine in the in the first version, he's angry. He's mm. he's drunk, but he's angry, and he fully knows what he's doing. He's mm. basically uh, saying um, uh, f f you to everyone around him for not um, uh, giving him his highest praise. Yeah, so I think in every version there are aspects that work really well and there's probably aspects that are like, "Mm, okay, I think you're going to get that with any remake, any, you know, we were discussing like the different versions of, you know, because Frederick Mark March was one of the uh, actors that played Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Then we were talking about John Barrymore and Spencer Tracy as well. And then obviously Anthony Perkins, other people that have played the role in, in later years. There's probably elements in every single remake that work really well. And it just depends on where you're coming at it, where, what you're interested in. Is it Norman's character that you're more interested interested in or is it the starlet character is it a combination and it also depends on how well the couple work together and I think at least in the versions that we have seen and by all reports of the the two later versions as well is that that was the thing that they all had in common that the the lead actress and the lead actor actually worked really well together well even the in Lady Gaga's version I think there was something where she insisted on um on her male co-star, I'm um, doing his actual vocals or something. 
Yeah, yeah. So they had that big song with what, the shallows or shallow or something like that. I can't but remember, it was, but it was in every shopping centre for ages afterwards. I, yeah, there's just like um, like a – it's not a cadenza, I, but there's just some sort of vocal break in the middle of that song I don't like. So. Yeah, I, 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 it always made me feel very sad. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was buying bread and canned peas and stuff as yeah. that song came on the PA. Yeah, it's just there's something just overly – I think that's why I strayed away from that version. There was just seemed – like something very modernly depressing about the 2018 version. It, it almost reminds me of when I saw this uh, DVD of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari that had a, a soundtrack on, and this wasn't the original soundtrack. It was what mu- mu- ever music the DVD producer had uh, put over it, and probably because they felt like because it's uh, an, uh, an old silent film, they had to... Uh, they probably thought that uh, people wouldn't be able to follow follow it just visually, and had to really overcompensate with ha- with dramatic sound. And it was just like this constant high pitch string quartet the whole time that was just like making you feel like you were listening to a washboard washboard the whole time. Mm. And no, th- this has nothing to do with how uh, Lady Gaga sings. She's a beautiful singer, but it just the 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 constant one mood tone yeah. of, of the film dominated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so it's like. No, no rest, and uh, no rest, and so it went. It's a bit and, relentless. And at the really and, tragic yeah. points, it was kind of like uh, it was just. A, I mean, you could say it was by artistic design, but when, um, but when the modern equivalent of Norman Maine um hanged himself in his garage, it, uh, while sad, it was f- far. It was far less surprising, and you and you feel like uh, the the whole movie was uh, railroad tracks going down to an inevitable path. There's not that um tragic oh it could have worked differently yeah. as you feel with james mason yeah and even with the you know because i suppose that was his one redeem norman's redeeming feature is that he did love her and did you know if he could get over himself enough he did want the best for her and he did help her with her career and both versions of esther so um and i do like how in all the the different versions of the film they have kept the names sort of they've they've kept the names you know, or used elements of the name. So in the first version, Janet's version and Frederick's version, and then the remake with Judy and James, they, the characters had the same names. And then obviously Vicky Lawrence was the, um, was the performing name for their female characters. But even in the Chris Christopherson Streisand version and Gaga Bradley Cooper version, I think his name was Jackson Maine in that one. And then Norman was part of his name in the Chris Christopherson version. And I'm pretty sure that all of the versions of the of the girls either had Esther as part of their name or was their name. So it was kind of nice that at least they kept some of those original elements in there. Mm. Um, I just, yeah, I kind of... I, pr- I think I preferred the first version. I'm not sure why. I, I, I think I really liked Frederick March. I hadn't seen – I always knew of him and, and, and knew that he'd starred in a lot of gothic sort of things, but uh, that was my first time really sort of seeing him, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. And they were, both of them, uh, Frederick and Janet, were nominated for Academy Awards, um, unfortunately didn't win. I was surprised with the the earliest version that it was, turned out to be a David O. Selznick production mm. because when I think of Rebecca, which he was pr- the producer of in Hitchcock's uh, first film in America, as well as Gone with the Wind, which were only made like um, two and three years after A Star is Born and they have such a different uh, tone, far more ambitious and large scale even rebecca which is just set in a country manner mm. uh, it has that uh, that a uh, big gothic horror, horror mm. story um action, action uh, uh, energy to it and so maybe because selznick was a producer but he was a very hands-on producer yeah and really he was also like a closet writer uh, so he was a uh, letting his creative outlet out this way uh, so i don't know maybe by the time of Re- Rebecca and Gone with the Wind, he just had more confidence. Yeah. Well, they were saying that this film, it was, you know, back then it was a box office um, hit. It did make a few hundred thousand dollars profit, which was good for them. And they also understood that, you know, films that were set in and around Hollywood about people that live there actually could be quite entertaining to the general public. So it did receive quite a good reception from the audience Hence well, the reason, the, yeah. Well, by the 30s, um, 
Hollywood as a concert had become such a a subconscious part of American and, to an extent, international culture. It wasn't um, like uh, movies were a well-established art form by by then. Um, the cliches of the star system were well-known. Everybody wanted to be an actress or mm. an actor. So that is, uh, that, that is no surprise that um, they just sort of start becoming self-analytical by this time. Yeah. And they... As each uh, film gets made, uh, it also reflects sort of the uh, the upper crust desires of the wider population and uh, sort of analysing the truth within. And so it does go from like when everybody wanted to be a straight actor to when uh, uh, it was more idealistic to be uh, perhaps a big uh, movie, movie musical person, even though, uh, and the story goes into that, where they were sort of losing out to television. Uh, yes, so that's mo- right, yeah. Yeah, so the movie industry was getting tighter. Uh, but then when it moves more into in the 70s and now when it's sort of almost more fashionable to be a pop singer at times. So I reckon in the uh, in, within our lifetime we might see another version of the story where instead it's going to be social media influences yeah. <laughs> um, that are in the in the main roles. and uh, Yeah, prob- somebody's, sadly, yeah, probably. Yeah, well, somebody's following goes down while the others <laughs> rises. Actually, I could say I'm sure. I'm sure the younger. Um, Maybe I should work on the script for that. Now. Yeah, actually, someone <laughs> be, is an Instagram influencer and then promotes some. Well, I, can, I mean, if you know, if the script's there for it, it could work. Um, I was Anyone just, steals this idea, yeah. I'll kill you. <laughs> um, I was just reading that um, you know uh, Judy Garland's version. Um, uh, Sid Luft, who was Judy Garland's husband, he was actually um, approached initially to be the director of this film and then Garland was having her issues with MGM, etc. so it got sort of held back a little bit more before they actually made the film. And um, George Cukor actually wanted Cary Grant uh, to play the James Mason character. Um, He'd have been the right age. Yeah, he would have been the right age. Um and also Stuart Granger as well. Um, Cary Grant, I think, actually suffered a bit in private life with... Uh, didn't he um, get into LSD late in life or something? Yeah, there were sort of rumours about Cary Grant because he was, you know, he lived with some of his male acting friends and things like that and got married and had a child quite late with a much younger woman. So I think a lot of these people who had, like we were discussing Montgomery Cliff before and a few other people, it was normally if they were kind of hiding something about their background. Um, But, yeah, so ultimately they went through, yes, Stuart Granger and even people like Frank Sinatra were considered for the role of James Mason's character, but he was ultimately hired and, um, you know, James Mason was a, you know, had originally come from the UK, but was doing very well for himself. It was um, a perfect midlife crisis movie. Yeah, it, it was. I'm just reading here that, um, you know, that Judy was quite unstable as a leading lady and because of her chemical dependencies, her weight fluctuations, her illnesses and hypochondria. So that really gives an illustration that she was the, she was the living embodiment of the Norman um, main character. Um, yeah, even, even the, the, the big um, number that she did, Born in a Trunk, which is one of the big sort of like musical set pieces uh, that goes on for quite a few minutes in the film, it actually um, was completed after George Cukor had left the production, which is interesting. So it is it is a long film. It's 196 minutes. This is the Judy Garland version. But even the um, Janet version, that comes in at an hour and 50 minutes. And uh, they trimmed it down. And at least it, I don't have a problem with long films as long as you get that break in the middle. <laughs> But in modern cinema, you don't. You just literally have to sit there, and you know that's sort of the that's sort of the end of that. And I think you know, I think films are just overly too long, and they don't need to be. I think the Judy version of this one could have been cut down a little bit. There were some sort of sequences I thought were like, yeah. I think that half the average length of the film these days is um, on the personal whim of Christopher Nolan because I think his <laughs> ones tend to be the longer ones. Yeah, I just, yeah. I well, mean, films are regularly coming in at well over two and a half to three hours regularly. Um, and the film I'm looking, the only sort of film I'm looking forward to seeing is Top Gun Maverick just because I grew up with Top Gun and stuff. I'm wondering actually what the running time of that one will be, but it's Top Gun Maverick, so, you know. Well, I'm going to see one of Wagner's operas uh, next week and that'll be going in a 
like four hours before you know when most Hollywood productions will be that length. <laughs> I think they will, and I'm a um, I'm a big fan of the old um, uh, TV uh, miniseries. So I, I just think you can break it up or do it over a few films if you've got the material there to do it. So, um, but two really interesting two interesting takes on the same story, and obviously the '70s version and the recent 2018 version obviously have their fans as well because Streisand and Gaga have such huge fan bases themselves, um, as well as the male leads Chris Christopherson in, in his own right he was a singer and an actor and then Bradley Cooper I don't know if he does does much singing now but um you know he obviously can sing for a movie role if he needs to so, Maybe in the shower. so yeah <laughs> yeah so they sort of played it up a lot when they were sort of she was touring around he used to come to a lot of her shows this is Lady Gaga that is and, and obviously they sang this, their hit song at the Academy Awards um, yeah, so both of these films had a really good critical reception and um, are extremely well known to this day, especially I would say the, the Judy Garland version. So uh, two, two films worth checking out. Probably the four films are worth checking out if you like the story enough. Yeah, well, I still haven't seen the Barbara Streisand version, so it'll be uh, quite a change uh, seeing her go from Hello Dolly to this role. Yeah, I mean, I... And meet the Fockers. Y- yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, she sort of had, you know, her big era of acting was in the 70s and 80s, I guess. That was when she did The Way We Were, wasn't it? Yes, she did The Way We Were. She did The Main Event. She did, um, you know, actually my favourite film role that she's in, she's playing this woman that's in in a mental home or something's called Nuts, which is appropriate for her, I think. But, you know, like... Like a lot of singers who act, they're very good at playing different versions of themselves. And in fact, actually, most well-known actors are the sort of art of um, of character acting isn't sort of with us as much as it used to be. So, you know, uh, Barbara Streisand is very good at playing different versions of herself, and she does it quite well. And uh, so, I, I'm actually, I actually wouldn't mind. I probably prefer the more '70s style music. So, I'm actually, I will actually seek out and watch the '76 version of A Star Is Born. So, yeah, so ultimately that was our take on these two. Yeah, it was interesting seeing a film that was the original version based off an original story and then a a clear remake, which was done on a bigger, grander scale. So it's actually interesting that the A Star Is Born has four very alike versions and yet very different versions as the the time periods the actors the actresses the the whole thing of when each of these films were made and what audiences they were sort of going for at the time so well worth checking out i think both versions and the four versions of the films yeah it's the sort of storyline where it's uh, so easy to make a fresh interpretation each time it doesn't get tired yeah and actually even though you were joking around that social media aspects that could be that could be the fifth version of the film you know well it's like Orson this interview Orson Welles did in old age and he was talking about how uh, film actors in in that time in the 70s when he did the interview couldn't be as great as they used to be because of a film of being a film or a Hollywood actor was not the greatest thing to be anymore because all the kids wanted to be pop singers yes and to an extent I do I do agree with him and because like when you think of many um uh, young people now, um, even the greatest uh, fantasists, they probably don't think so much of being uh, an artist, although some do. They are, uh, they want mm-hmm. to be uh, media, social media influencers, or um, or entrepreneurs because there's, I guess, there's this interpretation of power and control. Yeah, yeah. That, it, that it's that it's literally. Uh, so, like, wh- whereas Clark Gable and Vivian Lee and Cary, Gl- Cary Grant were. Uh, worshipped and celebrated for how uh, they portrayed uh, uh, characters they get to be worshipped for just being represent well representing not, themselves representing themselves mm. although not necessarily their true, the true self, self but, it, but yeah. it's that it's that next level of um uh i wouldn't say, fame uh, sort of well, thing yeah i was going to say fueling vanity but that yeah. sounds too harsh yeah. um no, I know what you. I know what you mean, but I'm. I'm actually hoping that in this initial period of social media and stuff, there will be a backlash, and we do get back to get away from reality TV, which is scripted anyway. It's just a lot cheaper to make. But um, oh, yeah. Rachel, you yeah. are so wrong. I'm getting out of here. I'm sick of this. You, there's enough. <laughs> 
No, Matt. Oh, sorry, Matt's, uh, I, sorry. I spilled <laughs> a little bit. I no. a little bit of tea. I didn't mean to make a mess. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I think Matt got into watching reality shows thanks to his lovely wife Meg. So. <laughs> A uh, forced viewer is more accurate. Uh, um, so I'm just I'm just cleaning up the mess I yeah. made by trying to be a reality TV <laughs> star. See, this is what reality TV does. It ruins your life. You just become a victim of the uh, character you try to be. Yeah. And then before you know it, you've got tea on your laptop. Oh, as long as <laughs> well, your beloved MacBook, hopefully oh, that's okay. Oh, oh, oh yeah. it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we know um, <laughs> there, there probably will be a fifth version of the, of these films. Uh, we are going lavish well, again. I'm sure, well, I'm sure there's like a, a million plays and biblical stories that have a similar narrative too. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, speaking of um, big biblical narrative sort of stories. Oh, yeah, that was a pretty good segue. Yeah, segue, even segue if by into our introduction. <laughs> our next episode, now these films just make the cutoff for the time period that we that we we basically do silent films that we specialize in that we specialize in right up to sort of 1959 um we're doing like two big budget massive out there masculine however you want to characterize and we're doing spartacus and ben-hur now both of these films were made in the very very late 50s ben-hur was was released in 59 spartacus does come in at 1960 but obviously was made in 59 so um we're, we're gonna let it pass that's how we'll let psycho get in so we can discuss that one day um so we're doing spartacus and ben-hur and uh i saw these films years ago but I'm looking forward to revisiting them. Um, haven't seen them since I was a child. So looking forward to those two. So that's um, real big marquee, you know, what Hollywood's famous for. And it's it's nice to revisit some of these big films. So that's what we're doing for the next when movies were good. Yeah, I'm looking looking forward to it. Um, my wife is not going to hear me talk for a while because I'll be busy on my iPad with those epic films with the headphones. Yeah, that- <laughs> That's right. I actually have to make sure, you know, I sit down and I'll probably have to watch them. When I did watch both of those films, I actually was fortunate enough to watch them at the a big movie theatre um, sort of in the central suburbs of Melbourne that specialises in showing old films and they even do the intermission and everything. So I actually saw them with my mum years and years ago where you did get the intermission and went out and had an ice cream or something and came back in. Um, so when I'm watching them at home and just refreshing my memory of them, I'll have to make sure I, I take that intermission. It's just good to have a bit of a break and then you can come back and then re- visit the second part of the story which is which is always good and um of course don't forget that uh um, matt will just quickly run you through our social media we are available on all the main ones aren't we matt yes on facebook twitter and instagram or uh, i i don't know apparently if uh, elon musk has his way it might be called at elon witter or something yeah <laughs> I'm actually glad that he's kind of gotten involved. That's why I kind of signed out of my Twitter account, never went back in because I just, you know, I I didn't like how some people were being banned off the platform and then other people were free to rant and rave about what they wanted to. And I thought, well, you either let everyone rant and rave or you restrict everybody. You can't just do it, you know, uh, can you know, whatever your political views are or whatever. And so I kind of got over Twitter and I just kind of logged out and never logged back in again. But I'm sort of curious to perhaps start up my, uh, get my account going and and do a bit more posting on there now, if it is genuinely going to be a bit more open. And you only argue and are stupid on Twitter if you want to be. You can just use it to get out the information about your projects and that's what it should be used for. I don't know why people bother arguing with people on these things. Yes, and I'm pretty sure Roseanne... uh, uh, wishes that she uh, left her phone um somewhere far away from her bed before she uh, did the late night twitters <laughs> that's exactly right i just think it's re- yeah i i kind of got over that because unfortunately some of the big social media platforms are really happy to ban certain people and then other people are allowed to mm. rant abuse rave and they don't get stopped so i'm like you either do it t- fairly to everybody or you just let it be a free for all you can't have it both ways well, so people have just become very childish thanks to social media i mean like even mm-hmm. that whole uh, episode with um jk rowling and her um and her uh, gender views i think in the days when it was just um uh, no social media and yeah. just uh, an interview with terry wogan or yeah. <laughs> or dick cavett there'd have probably been like a couple of sentences discussed on a certain philosoph- philosophical topic and that would have right. been that yeah. but uh, every everybody um uh finds ways to um 
uh, flare flare up uh, over quite frivolous things. Yeah, and I think he was um, not that I'm saying that matter was yeah. frivolous, but I'm talking about when people argue over, I don't know. Uh, how how to pat it, how to hold a dog or something. Yeah, it's just just such petty, stupid things, and and so I don't know why people bother responding to someone having a go at them because they're just you know they're just so inconsequential in their lives anyway. So that's kind of our take here at when movies were good. So we'll be interested to see how some of these social media platforms go forward. But thank God we discuss old films because honestly, you know. <laughs> The way some of these modern films are going. Although I, I – um, and just before I go, I just wanted to um, send a shout-out to one of my favourite actors that passed away this week. He he was a lover of old films. He was not in old films himself. Um, the wonderful Jerry Vadorn, who um, was a, a dual daytime Emmy winner and um, my beloved big brother. And hopefully Larry is uh, treating you well up there and not taking you to the bar every five seconds. So I'll just leave it at that, yeah. 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 Well, I'm sure the alcohols are, are <laughs> much less uh, side effect prone over there. <laughs> That's true. So hopefully, you know, he's having fun with probably a lot of other people he knows up there as well. So, and they're all having fun together and doing lots of cool plays and movies up there wherever they are. So, um, I just wanted to say that. And so we will see you on the next episode of When Movies Were Good for our Spartacus Ben Hur double. And also stay tuned because we will in the next few weeks probably have a new episode of A Glimpse of Hell. Uh, sort of true crime slash historical true crime discussion podcast as well yeah so can't wait to uh, talk to you then been a uh, great chatting you again and also without a cold this time uh, yes yeah. yeah it's definitely cold season here in melbourne and now that we're finally all unmasked which we have to be we've just got to kind of get our natural immunity back uh, especially where i work in a pharmacy everyone's coming in as sick as anything but they are just cold so you know it's to be expected i'll just poke them with a stick if yeah. you can get too sniffly <laughs> yeah and you can yeah if you're not well or whatever you can always wear a mask yourself so you know it's your choice to do that so thank you for joining us and as always i'm rachel i'm matthew and we're watching good movies thank you and all the best <laughs>